Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. It's the last episode of the night. All right, because it's like 3 a.m. All right, so um, longtime viewers of the show might recognize this winery that we're about to do here. Um, so small backstory. Um, I was tried to um, interview one of the owners of the winery. I believe it was Chris. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember which one, but um, we were gonna. Inter I was gonna interview him um, to talk about uh, legislation that's been put into the Texas legislature, which I think this is the third session. So we have two years. There's a two-year session, so I think this is the third time that this bill has been proposed, and they're trying to create a thing where. If you have a Texas appellation on the label, it must be 100% Texas grapes. Um, not many places do that. Federal law is 75% is the minimum. There are places in California, Washington, Oregon that um, require higher percentages, um, but uh, not many places do 100%. Big debate here in Texas. Um, matter of fact, I, I was chatting with somebody at that Portuguese um, masterclass who is a winemaker here in Texas, and he's all gung-ho for 100%, and I pretty much on purpose play devil's advocate. I want to see 100% Texas grapes and fruit, but you know when I talk to Texas winemakers from all over the state, um, there is, is a reality, or at least their version of reality, that um, we're maybe not quite at the point where we can do it for everybody. These guys are doing it. But yeah, they're not 200,000 case production either. So, um, and they're not producing wines that are like $8 and $10 either. So, and, and that's, that's where there's, this, there's a disconnect between what some people are saying is possible and other people are saying is not possible. And I'm not really sure which side of the story is 100% true. I'm not trying, that wasn't a pun, but which story is the truth or are there two versions of the same truth? I don't know. Anyway, so, hey, I, I, I was carrying a wine at Morton's when I worked there and it was Texas Appalachian when I first brought it on and then they, did, they couldn't get enough fruit because uh, the vineyards were decimated by weather and so they had to just call it American and I sent it back because if it's going to be on my list, it needs to be Texas. So that's part of the reality is that sometimes stuff happens with our, with our vineyards. Anyway, um, let's get into it. I know what I want to see happen, but I also know that not everybody can do it. So, uh, so this is the 2018, and I really want to interview these guys. I want them to like make, state their case. You know what I'd love to do before I get into this? I'd love to do is get like the William Chris guys and some other people that are advocates for 100%, and the other people who are saying, "Hey, man, we're not there yet, but they want to get there." And I'd like to put them all on a panel, like get three and three, because I can I can record six people on this. Whoops. I don't want to like stop anything by accident and um, not like have a battle royale and hash it out, but I would like to have like an intelligent, calm discussion as to each side's story. I would love to have that as a, one of my shows. That's my goal to do that, but I'll probably never happen because they'll probably never all going to agree to sit down in the same room and, and do it and uh, yeah probably never gonna it's probably never gonna happen I'll probably have to get like each person to do their side of the story and like just 
shut up and let them talk instead of like put my opinion in there. Um, all right. So here's the 2018 William Chris, Mary Ruth, white wine, Texas. So give you a little background on this. So this is made up of 54% Moscato Giallo, which I really don't know what that grape is. Um, but there's like a thousand billion varieties of Moscato. So our Muscat, um, 21% of, I'm sorry, 25% Blanc Dubois, 21% uh, Malvasia Bianca, uh, and that's it. I've had this wine in the past. Matter of fact, I think this is one of the wines we did in the interview. Screw cap, yay! Though I don't have any more. Oh. Nope, it doesn't fit. So, just in case it fit. All right. So this will be vacuum in, which means we're gonna crush this soon. Which in my past I remember liking this. I remember liking this wine in the past. So this is like a this is kind of like a, a signature wine for them, iconic wine. Oh, it, it costs uh, twenty eight dollars. They don't have a lot of retail presence in Texas. It's pretty much you have to buy it either at a restaurant, which would be more than that, or buy it from the buy it from the winery. Wow, just all kinds of stuff. Like the Moscato is really coming through. So Moscato has like really a grapey smell to it. Uh, and that's really, I think, why a lot of people like Moscato. I don't know if it's any residual sugar in there, but it smells kind of sweet. And there's like this, I don't want to say bubble gum or cotton candy, but there's like this candied, almost honeyed characteristic to it. I mean, it smells like really nice and I'm expecting a sweet wine. Um, I mean, I'm expecting basically Moscato and having gone to a Moscato Dosti masterclass uh, a couple months ago, like I have a, a better respect for Moscato now as, as a wine. So yeah, it's like peach. That's what it is. It's peaches. Almost like not quite peaches and cream, but peaches. Almost like a creamsicle. Almost. But yeah, it smells really nice. So let's taste it. So it's definitely not sweet, which is nice. Um, but you still get the peachiness. Almost you get a little bit of that, that uh, creaminess to it. Um, the acid though is kind of ripping high, man. Um, but, uh, really refreshing. The fruit is tart only because of the acidity. I think the fruit is actually kind of ripe, but the acidity really kind of brings back the fruit and it's like, not today. You know, we're going to be a little tart. We're going to be a little, yeah, we're going to be tart. Um, it's refreshing though. And that again, the, the, the Moscato is really coming through with that, even though it's only 54%. Moscato can be really, really powerful and great uh, flavor. It's basically peaches for days and like creamsicle and tartness and acidity and um, really tasty. Um, I probably should have a bigger chill on it. I mean, I had it cold, but it's gone through like a couple a couple reviews. Uh, so it's warmed up a little bit more. So um, I think it would be a little more refreshing, maybe not as um, tart um, if it was a little bit colder. But I don't want to like ice cold, but it's very refreshing, especially for like Texas summers. Which I know by the time you see this, it's going to be like freaking September. Actually, yeah, I think this is going to be like September 1st or 2nd. It's going to be like, I think, it's, the thing is, I think this is the Labor Day episode. Because I'm supposed to uh, <clears throat> review these. I'm not doing them today because... Well, I'll tell you a story real quick. So I got some vermouths from California. They sent me a red and a white or a dry, and the red busted 
So I said, hey, red busted. And they said, we'll send you another one. They sent me another white one, another dry one. And I just figured that out today. So. <clears throat> yeah, there's like this peach and tart and orange and grape and um, 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 like apple green apple and lime and like like a like a like a like a a, a sour starburst type of thing really nice I like it all right I'm moving on wine number two all right this is the 2000 uh, is it non-vintage? Okay, the notes say 18. Am I missing it somewhere? Huh. I don't see the vintage on here. But the email telling me which wines I was getting tells me it's an 18. So unless it's hiding somewhere on the label, I'm going to call this non-vintage because legally that's what it is, considering there's no vintage on here. That's interesting. I didn't know they made any non-vintage wine at William Chris. All right. So we'll just call it the Texas High, Texas High Plains Rosé. Can you have a non-vintage wine like that? I don't know. I don't see the vintage on here. Um, I have time between the time I have to put this out and today to figure out if there's a vintage. If you see a vintage in the lower third, that means it's actually vintage for some reason on the label. If you see NV, it means it's non-vintage. Um, I'll, I'll put like a note on there. Anyway, uh, yeah. So um, this is a combination of 58% Sangiovese, 31% Riesling, 11 set Mourvedre, and 2% Pinot Meunier. Also known as just Meunier now, for the most part. All right, the screw cap, yay! It's almost a copper color. It's not quite just like you know, that typical salmon color. Um, it's almost copper. I, I, I'm still looking for the vintage on here. I mean, I know I got my contacts on. Sometimes I can't read small print, but you would think it would be obvious. Like 10 things like hit me all at once while kind of in succession. And, I, and then, I, then they're like fleeting. I'm like, what was that again? I swear it was like leather and strawberry and peach and sprite <laughs> like lemon lime like a spritzer that you're smelling an orange and wow all kinds of good stuff man but there is a spritziness to it you know at least in, on the nose i mean it's not actually spritzy but Yeah. Laffy Taffy. Banana. Banana uh, Taffy. Carbonic? I don't know. Yeah, that's what it was. Unusual. Let's taste it. So the banana really isn't there on the on the palate. I had like a fleeting glimpse of it, but it's definitely more the strawberry, raspberry. Not quite watermelon, but um, yeah, maybe like that little like watermelon hard candy that you know you you know like in that like stick you get as a kid. Um, 
but there's also a bit of complexity to it. Um, there's a touch of earthiness to it, non-fruit characteristics. It's really high in acid, really refreshing, really tart. Yeah, I call it kind of tart. It's almost salty too. It's an interesting rosé. It's definitely not like a lot of rosés you get anywhere else in the world. Um, there's definitely um, some good fruit, but it's kind of tart and yeah, the banana on the nose was like kind of wild, but I think I was kind of looking for like unusual things and it just kind of hit me kind of weird. There's a flavor there. I'm having a hard time identifying, but it tastes good. This is definitely, to me, a rosé that needs food. While you could really super chill it and sit on the porch and kind of hang out and drink it, I kind of want some cured meat with it, like some prosciutto or salami, like, you know, a charcuterie plate, like, you know, some savoriness, some savory cheeses, um, that type of thing. That's what I think I would like with this wine. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I really like it. All right, so I don't need that glass anymore. Red wine glass. All right, wine number three. Uh, this is the 2017, see the light there? See, like the label's like messed up here. There it is. It's on there, 2018, okay. Um, so 2017, uh, William Chris, Morvedra, Texas High Plains. Boom, here we go. Uh, this retails for, I told you this retails for 25, right? This retails for $34. And I believe this is 100% Morvedra. So I'm gonna read the little like, little like write up thing here. It's the last one in the night. I, I never like changed the, I never got the extra uh, cartridge, so. Let's hope it works. So William Chris currently makes more Mavedra than anyone else in the state of Texas and believe Morvedra is a grape that truly shows what Texas wines can do. Because wineries and growers are discovering how amazing this grape does in Texas, there's currently a two year wait for Mavedra vines. Uh, using fruit from all over the state, even though it says Texas High Plains. Um, wine grower Chris uh, Brundrit uh, describes the wine as a fun blend of, a fun blend that expresses Mervedra as a whole and showcases all of Texas. So my guess is 75% comes from Texas High Plains and then the rest of it comes from elsewhere. If I remember my labeling laws properly. So there's like this reddish brown quality to it. Yeah. It looks kind of old world-ish. Let's check it out. Thirty-four bucks, just so you know. On the nose alone, I think you should buy it, but. So it's spice driven. It's, um, it's got a meatiness to it. It's got like a, like almost like a, a cured meat, a salami, um, or is it salumi? Um, with a pepper on it. Dried cranberry. It 
It's the last one that I'm, I'm swallowing this stuff. I'm drinking this. I'm not going to do the whole bottle tonight, but I'm drinking this for the rest of the episode. Um, so there's some really nice red fruit on it. It's a little bit tart, but it also kind of finishes somewhat ripe. Um, it's kind of a cherry cranberry mishmash. Um, and you've got some really good spice in there. I've got a clove. I've got a touch of cinnamon. Um, I've got a little allspice in there. Got a little bit of pepper, black pepper. Um, a little bit of tomato leaf. Um, there's something an earthiness to it. Yeah, I mean, it's like a balanced wine between fruit and non-fruit spice. Um, it's a bit woody, like 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 the, the uh, antique shop type of thing I've talked about. You can kind of almost smell like the, and taste like the, um, like the uh, 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 polishing lemon oil that, you know, it's almost like a, like a freshly polished table. Um, so you get a little bit of that in there. It's a little hot, um, a little high alcohol. So let's see what the alcohol is. 14.5. Um, got a little bit of a burn. It's easier to, it's easier to feel the, sorry, I didn't mean to like hit that. It's easier to feel the burn, um, when you swallow than just when you're tasting. Um, but yeah. This is why I could sit back and like let it develop over like a two, three, four hour period. Decant it or just let it, you know, let it sit in the glass uh, over time, like take like a long time to drink one glass. But since it's a really narrow neck, um, if I was gonna do something like that, I probably wouldn't leave it in the bottle, I'd probably decant it, just so it gets the, his, get some oxygen into it. It's smoky, it smells like Texas. Um, there's a, there's a Texas countryside, um, dustiness to it. I mean, it smells and tastes like the Texas Hill Country. Not quite the Texas High Plains. It's not that, not, it's not that dusty, but there's definitely this rustic quality to it that you can't get in Texas. I'm, I'm, we're not the only state that probably has this, but I mean, it reminds me of being out in the country type of thing. I feel like I'm getting a buzz already. I mean, it's been a minute since I had any food. I'm gonna finish right there. This wine is good. It's like really good. It's like great. You should buy it if you can find it or call the winery or email them or go online. Uh, 34 bucks, you should buy it. Uh, these these wines are really good too, but I mean this this wine like kind of was like star of the show for this show. It's kind of the star. It's it this one in where is it? Tonight's stars for me are these two. Now, William and Chris, I hope you're not like pissed off. I'm using this wine. Jason, I hope you're not pissed off from using this wine as comparisons, like like really good examples of Texas wine making. But yeah, um, but yeah, this excellent wine. You should try it. All right, cool. All right, that's gonna do it for tonight. Uh, click the links below to friend me up. Click the links below to learn more about William Chris. Hit the donate button over there. Send me a couple ducats. Help with a couple costs to go into Oregon, and we'll see everyone again next time.